I told them not to let him out. I said, he's not ready to come out in society. He's not pretending to be crazy. He's real life crazy. The accused gunman set a fire inside the store, so they're certain he intended to hurt more people. Why? Why? Why would you want to do this to our, our family and, sh and try to kill both of my babies? The following stories tell the tale of three brutal killers reacting to finding out they have been sentenced to death. We have a man who shot and killed four people for no reason at all, a man who opened fire at a Walmart after being fired from there, and a man who murdered a cop and his pregnant ex-girlfriend. had power over my life for four years and I've struggled for four years. He don't get that power today. So no, I don't have anything to say to him. Emotions run high as the man convicted of brutal murders in 2013 is sentenced to death. The first de death penalty imposed since Nebraskans voted to bring it back. Nico Jenkins had a lot to say in court throughout the last four years, but today he was noticeably quiet. This is Nico Jenkins. He killed four people in just 11 days. Nico had a very rough upbringing. In fact, he came from a family of felons. He had a traumatic life at home and struggled with things like anxiety and bedwetting as a result. He was put into the foster care system, but still struggled with what he experienced in the past. Sometimes he would say he heard voices, and sometimes he would have conversations with himself. Nico turned to a life of crime at a young age and spent time in juvenile detention. At just 15 years old, he was found guilty of carjacking and sentenced to 18 years behind bars, but he was released early. This is one of the worst things that could have happened because it was just weeks after his release that he went on this killing spree. Nico's wife spoke about the kind of person that he was. He's not pretending to be crazy. He's real life crazy. Shalonda Jenkins says in the five years she's known her husband, Nico, he suffered a plethora of mental illness and claims to be controlled by an Egyptian god, Apophis. Yes, you heard that right. This is what he believed he was controlled by. Nico specifically told me that Apophis gives him orders. Nico told her Apophis saved him from attempting to die in solitary confinement a few years ago. It was this voice that came and was just like, if you do what I tell you to do, if you follow my demands, then I'll make sure you're safe and make sure you're okay. She says that she believed that her husband was not mentally stable enough to have been released from prison in the first place. She even tried to make sure that he was kept in incarceration. I told them not to let him out. I said he's not ready to come out in society. But they let him out anyway. The first of Nico's murders occurred on August 11th of 2013 in Omaha. The victims were 29-year-old Jorge Cajia Ruiz and 26-year-old Juan Irby Pena. They were both sh to death in a pickup truck by a swimming pool, and their pockets had been turned inside out, indicating that they were likely robbed. The next murder occurred just days later on August 18th. Nico happened to run into an old cellmate of his at a party. This man's name was Curtis Bradford, and he was 22 years old. Initially, their interaction seemed to be positive, and the two people were just reconnecting. They even took this picture to post on Facebook, showing them with their arms around one another. But just that next morning, Curtis was found dead. He had been shot. The last murder occurred on August 21st of 2013. Police in Omaha were notified of a situation involving shots fired. Shots fired 168 in Fort Street, 168 in Fort Street, Jeff. Car saw an SUV and a sedan at the intersection that heard four shots. The sedan pulled over and then left northbound. SUV. It didn't take long for them to realize how serious of a situation this was. No. This is the victim, Andrea Kruger, who is 33 years old, a wife and a mom with three young children. She had just finished a bartending shift at this lounge. She headed home when all of a sudden she was stopped by another vehicle. Nico went to her car, pulled her gun out, and shot her multiple times. He then jumped into her car and stole it. 
This was the fourth senseless murder in just a matter of days. At the time, police didn't know who could possibly be behind these terrible cases. And then August 30th came, and there was yet another incident. A woman called the police and told them that Nico had threatened to kill her family. He was then arrested. They then got a search warrant for his home and discovered a bag that contained the gun that matched the casings found from the most recent murder scene. It also had Curtis Bradford's DNA on it. They were also able to get surveillance footage that showed he had been in the area of the scene of the crime. Now, it was time for the interrogation. While sitting in a bright yellow prison jumpsuit, Nico shook his head impatiently as he waited for someone to arrive and question him. Here you go. I'm gonna call you me alone. I need to speak to someone. Okay. That's what makes my mind frame goes back. I'm, obviously, I'm schizophrenic bipolar, so I don't take medication. So right now, that's why I'm going to stay. That's why I told them they need to hurry up when okay. I'm in this mind frame. But Nico's demands didn't end there. The sheriff office and you guys need to be honest with me. Okay. Because if we're going to make this work and get this closure for this family, mm -hmm. you're going to have to tell me what you have and what you don't have. That way I know if I have to go get it for you because these are my cousins. He then began to explain that he had extended family members in prison that might try to harm him. And that's why I didn't want to talk down at the jail because there's family members on my dad's side because this is on my father's side. Okay. The investigator supplied him with a fresh cup of coffee and Nico assured them that he would tell them everything they would need to know to help ensure that Andrea's family got the closure they needed. He then begins to tell a bizarre story about a sacrifice to the god of the underworld. My religion of Katoni Asubel, that's the underworld, he was like on the mummy, the black book. So this was them, my little cousins, the one that were in the house with me. That when I got served the search one. Right. This was their ritual of sacrifice. And when I, I'm gonna give you from A to Z, this is not no goose chase. This is the real deal right here. So essentially, he was trying to say that Andrea's murder was some sort of sacrifice. He goes on to say that he chose Andrea because it was a good opportunity. It was dark out and it would be harder to get caught. Once you leave off of Midway, everything is black. Everything's black out there. So it was a perfect opportunity. And that's why y'all don't even understand, man. I don't understand how hard it is for me right now. Because I'm portraying my family. Do y'all understand it? This is not just me. I understand one family's getting closer, you know? but I'm literally betraying my family and my bloodline. Nico continued to talk and talk about himself until eventually the interrogator cut in. You gotta come back home. I understand. Because here, listen to me. But well, listen, listen, no, listen, I've listened to you for a long time. It's time for you to listen to me. Because like what you said, if you don't tell me what the heck happened out there, people are going to think the absolute worst. People are going to think the absolute worst. That's when the investigator hit Nico with the information he was probably least expecting. The DNA evidence. Do you not realize I got Nico Jenkins? Do you not realize that? I got Nico Jenkins. I got you. What do you mean you got me? I got your DNA at the murder scene. I got your DNA in the car. Sir. I got the weapon. I got Nico Jenkins. While Nico didn't deny the murder, he did blame the Nebraska Department of Corrections. He said that if they had offered him proper medical treatment for his mental illness, that this never would have happened. He also said that he heard the voice of the serpent god Adophis before he committed the murder. At this point, DNA connected Nico to the murders of Andrea and Curtis. But what about the two before them? It would late come out that Nico's sister lured them to a particular location promising them sexual acts, but Nico killed and robbed them. Curtis was also tricked. He was made to believe that he was going to take part in a robbery, but was then shot by Nico's sister and then by him. And as for Andrea, Nico killed her just because he wanted her vehicle so he could use it to continue to kill others. Nico had ruined the lives of four different families, but now he was behind bars to stay. As always, I want to thank the Omaha media for convening on such short notice for this press conference. The purpose of this press conference is to announce the arrest of 26-year-old Nico Jenkins on four counts of first-degree murder, four counts of use of a weapon to commit the murders, and four counts 
a felon in possession of a firearm. Nico was held without bond, and in a letter requesting psychiatric help, he said that he wished to plead guilty on all counts he was charged with. He would later try to sue the state of Nebraska to the tune of $24.5 million for what he believed entailed wrongfully releasing him from prison. He blamed his mental illness for the murders. Jenkins is in a 23-hour confinement cell, doesn't interact with other inmates, a staff member checks on him every 15 minutes, and now has a camera in his cell. It took some time for the case against Jenkins to actually go to trial. When he appeared for court appearances, he would debut a very different look after having mutilated his own skin for unknown reasons. This is Nico Jenkins when he was first booked for murder in September 2013. These exclusive photos show what he looks like now. More than once, Jenkins has gotten a razor blade that the prison says didn't come from his shaving equipment and bladed himself. Jenkins says he has nine lacerations to his face, tried to carve Satan into his forehead, and split his tongue. So how did this felon get a hold of something like a razor blade to begin with? The warden said he doesn't know how, and he couldn't guarantee it won't happen again. Attorney Don Klein, the prosecutor in this case, said that these sorts of problems were basically expected with this kind of criminal. That's always been a concern as to how to handle somebody like him and... Uh, he keeps doing things to himself, and that's the problem. It's, a sim it's as simple as that. I mean, it's as the judge said to him at the end of the hearing, don't cut yourself anymore. He also said that it was basically expected that Nico was going to do whatever he could to rebel against authority. He's been attempting by whatever means to manipulate the system uh, from the very beginning of this case, and that's just his nature. Clearly, it doesn't look on behalf of the prison for a dangerous inmate like Nico to keep getting his hands on something like this that could be used as a weapon. A Douglas County judge wants to know how convicted killer Nico Jenkins is still able to play his face while behind bars. Jenkins has gotten a hold of razor blades more than once, and authorities are not sure where he's getting them. It would turn out that maybe Nico was getting some sort of inside help in obtaining the razor blades he used to his face up with. They're not allowing him to shave anymore and that they actually caught one inmate trying to sneak a book under his door that had a razor in it. It took time for these court proceedings to play out. This was due in part for it being necessary to determine whether or not he was even capable of standing trial. It was later determined that while he wasn't mentally capable initially, he could be through the form of treatment to treat his many issues. Nico would finally be found guilty for all four of the murders in August 24. But unfortunately, it would take even longer for him to be sentenced due to needing to determine whether or not the death penalty would be used against him. His sentencing day would at last arrive in May of 2017. What was it going to be? Death or life behind bars? Four families were waiting to find out. This case has been delayed for years, leaving four families wondering what will happen to the man who killed their loved ones. Obviously, it takes a lot for someone to be sentenced to death for their crimes. But in this case, the three panel judge presiding deemed it was appropriate. A judge methodically explained why capital punishment is justified, citing a bunch of factors, including that the four-time killer has shown no remorse. Therefore, this panel finds that the death penalty is appropriate should be and is hereby given for each of the four murders by the defendant. One by one, they listed off Nico's crimes and subsequent sentences. Nico remained stone-faced and unemotional as the judge went on. He didn't shed a tear and he didn't visibly react in any way. Count one, murder in the first degree, a class four, class one felony, death. Count two, use of a deadly weapon, firearm to commit a felony, a class 1C felony, 45 to 50 years to run consecutive to all murder convictions. Later, it was Nico's turn to talk. Instead of apologizing for his actions and all those he hurt because of them, he used this opportunity to pretty much blame everyone other than himself. Then it was the convicted spree killer's turn to defend himself. Nico started a 40-minute statement where he said the judge, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and investigators were biased against him. He claimed the officers planted the evidence to match their theory, saying the bullets found in his duffel bag with his weapons didn't match the ones found at the crime scene. Nico's sentencing ensured the fact that under no circumstances would this killer ever see freedom another day in his life. Four death sentences 
and another 12 convictions, each with 45 to 50 years in prison. That is what the three panel judge ruled in the Nico Jenkins case. This was a case that shocked the nation and it was truly unlike any other the state of Nebraska had seen before. The defendant's commission of these four murders over a 10 day period is one of the worst killing sprees in the history of this state. The mother of victim Curtis Bradford spoke out about how she's taking back the glory that Nico tried to steal from her when he killed her son. Nico would not have control over her anymore. She was taking back her life for good. Meanwhile, he would be sent away to essentially rot in prison. You don't get the glory today. I get the glory. My family gets the glory. God gets the glory. To her, this has been a far too long coming. This has been too long. Four years is a long time. Attorney Don Klein spoke out about why he believes the death sentence is an appropriate choice in this case. Douglas County Attorney Don Klein says Jenkins is one of the most manipulative personalities they have ever seen. And his history is a very dangerous, dangerous person. And like I said, that's part of this process that the court found that he deserved the maximum punishment. Some of the factors that the three panel judge had to consider when coming up with this sentence is Nico's family history and mental illness. Ultimately, these factors did not outweigh the severity and true evilness of his actions, which he planned out ahead of time and did not feel guilty about, as one of the judges explained. Each one of these murders was a deliberate and planned act. The victims were pre-selected and the murders were purposeful. The trauma going through these court proceedings over a period of years was enough to exhaust the mother of Curtis Bradford, who wanted only to never return to court again. I'm ready to go home and heal. That's what I want to do. That's, I'm tired, I'm weary, and I'm ready to go home. I will never want to see this place here again. As of spring 2023, Nico Jenkins is now 36 years old and has yet to be ex- he did file an appeal to his sentence in April of 2020, but the Supreme Court refused to hear it. While he remains on death row, there is no telling when he might be executed, as these things often take years. But the important thing is that he will not be able to hurt innocent people again. The man accused of and killing two Walmart workers and injuring a South Haven police officer in July is headed back to Mississippi to face charges. That's right. This morning, 39-year-old Martez Abram waived extradition, meaning he will be transferred from the Shelby County Jail where he had been treated after being shot by South Haven police. Can you imagine going to work expecting it to be just another normal day when all of a sudden you find your life on the line? That's what happened to the employees of a South Haven, Mississippi Walmart in July of 2019. A man entered the store and just began shooting. He sh and killed two Walmart employees who were managers, including Anthony Brown and Brandon Gales. Brandon had been a manager at that Walmart for 16 years. The shooter also shot and injured a responding police officer who luckily survived. They say that officer survived only because he had a bulletproof vest on. The gunman was shot. He did survive. He's now under arrest. Two co-workers are dead. Shaken employees gathered outside, learning it was one of their own, and tonight the heartbreak and the search for answers in South Haven, Mississippi. It was a frightening scene outside of Walmart that morning. The area blocked off with police cars and ambulances. Confused and shocked employees were gathered outside, some counseling each other. A man who witnessed the horrifying event described what happened. Kind of shook up over it, really. Once people realized what was going on, they all just flooded out. It didn't take long for to be identified as 39-year-old Meritz Abram. He was actually a former employee of that same Walmart and knew the victims he killed because he worked with them. The main question was, why did he do this? It would turn out to be some strange attempt at revenge after he got fired from his job. Investigators said Abram had recently been suspended from his Walmart job for showing a knife when he went to the store that July morning and opened fire shooting killed his two Walmart workers and injured a South Haven police officer who was wearing a bulletproof vest. There were not only employees, but innocent customers at Walmart that day, all who could have also been victims of merits. Just spoke with the mayor of this city who says that the accused gunman set a fire inside the store, so they're certain he intended to hurt more people and are thankful their officers shut him down. Now, Meritz could have just gotten a new job or never brought a knife to work to begin with. But instead, he ended up claiming the lives of two people and earning himself multiple murder charges. Because he was injured in the shooting, he spent time recovering in the hospital.
hospital, which delayed his court appearance. After weeks of delays and rescheduling court dates, Martez Abram is now heading back officially to South Haven, Mississippi, a month and a half after that crime, which drew national attention. Now, this is Martez Abram walking into the Shelby County courtroom this morning after being hospitalized for weeks inside the Shelby County Jail. While in court, he took the stand in his own defense. While being questioned, he was made to watch video footage of his murders taking place. He cried and flinched when he looked at the screen, possibly trying to gain sympathy from the jury. That's you, is oh. Yes. Look at it, person. Yes. He grabbed his head with both hands and breathed heavily as the questioning continued. He scrunched up his face as if it was painful for him to watch the destruction that he caused. He wiped seemingly non-existent tears off his face. The prosecutor had to continuously remind him to look at the screen instead of turning away. Yes. While he's on the floor. Yes. After days in court, it was finally time for the case to be handed over to the jury. His fate was in their hands, and it didn't take long for them to make a decision. In fact, they only deliberated for about 55 minutes before reaching their verdict unanimously. Well, Greg and Stephanie, a jury just found that man, Martez Abram, guilty of killing two Walmart workers. Now, Abram has been found guilty on two counts of capital murder, plus one count of attempted first degree murder. Take a look at the verdict being read aloud in court, he remains still and silent, unlike before when he was watching the video footage. He does not visibly react to a double murder and attempted murder conviction. We, the jury, find the defendant, Martez Terrell Abram, guilty of capital murder in count one. We, the jury, find the defendant, Martez Terrell Abram, guilty of capital murder in count two. We, the jury, find the defendant Martez Terrell Abram guilty of attempted murder in count three. Now that Merritt was found guilty, the only thing left to decide was whether he would be sentenced to life in prison without parole or death. The judge ended up choosing the latter. In count one, I will sentence you to death. In count two, you will be sentenced to death. In count three, you will be sentenced to life. Merritt had no visible reaction to being sentenced to death and did not say anything. The prosecutor presiding over the case was pleased with this sentence. This sends a message to everybody that DeSoto County is a safe place to live and it is not a place to come and commit crime. But some people, including a woman who once considered herself to be a stepmother to him, felt the sentence was not fair. What about nationwide when there have been mass murders that have not got the death penalty? What about those that children and innocent, you know, innocent babies and those things. What about that? Merritt's remains on death row at this time. Most wanted man in Florida is waking up in a hospital this morning. Police captured Markeith Lloyd Tuesday night in Orlando. The chief says he resisted arrest and he's now being treated for minor injuries before they haul him off to jail. Markeith Lloyd is a truly dangerous man. In December of 2016, he went to the home of Sade Dixon, his pregnant ex-girlfriend. He wanted to confront her about problems related to their recent breakup. He would end up and killing her and shooting and injuring her brother. He then went on the run. But then on January 19th of 2017, a person shopping at Walmart spotted him after recognizing him from his picture on the news. Here's the security footage of him entering the store that day. They told police Lieutenant Deborah Clayton, who had been at the store that day. While she tried to stop him, he shot four times with a fatal shot to the neck. 
Once again, he managed to escape for days while a massive manhunt was conducted, and a reward with any information about his whereabouts was set at $100,000. The day he was finally captured in an abandoned home was one that was celebrated by many, including law enforcement. Police, along with sheriff's deputies and U.S. Marshals, surrounded an abandoned home Tuesday night in southwest Orlando. They've been tracking Lloyd's phone, and they were able to zero in on his location through pings. The police chief says when Lloyd walked out of the house, he was wearing tactical gear and these were the guns in his hands, which he then dropped to the ground. His capture was a major relief for the families of the victims. The mother of Sade Dixon expressed how she felt upon hearing that her daughter's killer and son's attempted killer was in police custody. My daughter, she deserved justice. She really does deserve justice and I'm glad he's caught. I'm glad now I can ask him why, why? Why would you want to do this to our, our family and, sh and try to kill both of my babies? Take a look at Markeith's first appearance in court. He was flanked with officers on either side of him while he wore a protective vest and bandage over his eye. He told the judge that he would be representing himself and declined a lawyer. He was very argumentative and expressed the fact that he didn't like how he was being portrayed to the media. Okay, so here's what I'm going to go ahead and do. Um, First of all, I, I got questions to ask. You're here for first appearances on awards, sir. Y'all making up shit like I just went in there and, and shit this girl, endangering my family. Okay, a judge is a. Want, cause what if other people want, want to do something back? Y'all, y'all, y'all betray this shit to the news people. Like I just went in there and shit this girl when it was other guns found on the scene. And all, and all kinds of shit. Government pulled on me. Markeith was faced with multiple charges, including two counts of murder. He tried to use mental illness as his defense. He was not the type to sit quietly in court and made multiple outbursts in which he criticized how he had been handled by law enforcement. I know you I know you do and you feel that way, but you should talk to your lawyer. He also tried to accuse investigators and other law enforcement officials of framing him. In a conversation with his daughter and his mother, Markeith said that he believed he deserves money from all of this. Write me a book. Write your work. Write your work. Give some money. Everybody else I get paid off my that man. Ultimately, the case went to the jury. Watch as his one uninjured eye grew wide in shock as he heard the verdict being announced. The state of Florida versus Markeith Lloyd. Verdict, count one. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one of the charge. The defendant is guilty of first degree murder of a law enforcement officer. The next thing to be determined was whether Markeith deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison or death for his crimes. Ultimately, the judge decided that death was appropriate. This is his reaction after finding out his fate. Markeith Lloyd having one more outburst as he was escorted out of the courtroom in handcuffs and foot shackles, looking at the sheriff in chief, yelling about oppression, ball and chain, and the system. I have nothing to say to him. I'm glad he's being put to death, and I'm glad I don't have to see his nonsense and his courtroom outbursts anymore. The family of Lieutenant Clayton were pleased with the sentencing as they told reporters outside of the courtroom. And thank you, Lord, the justice has been served today. Today is a good day, and I thank God for the outcome. It's definitely a relief. The sheriff who knew and worked with Lieutenant Clayton was also relieved by the sentence and believed that this is what Markeith deserved. He was also glad that this was finally coming to an end.